We built a 10 foot high and 96 foot long seasonal windbreak on our farm to help keep our greenhouse warmer and better protected from brutally cold and strong winter winds. How do we do it and what materials did we use? Why did we do it and design and size it like we did? Join me on the farm today as we discuss it and see if this sort of windbreak might be a good fit for your farm. First, the why. We built this windbreak to reduce heat losses for our 30 foot by 96 foot greenhouse. Greenhouses, like any other structure, suffer from convective heat loss in the winters when windy, cold storms blow in. We live in the northeast and cold fronts blow in fiercely. Add to that the fact that we're in a farmed area where most natural windbreaks have been removed and there's not much to slow down those winds. Why are cold winds a problem? In a word or three, convective heat loss. You can think of convective heat loss as the effect of blowing over a cup of hot soup or coffee. In effect, you're drawing heat away from the warmed object faster than it would otherwise give off heat. This happens in houses as well, accounting for a significant percentage of heat loss, especially for structures that aren't as well sealed. Greenhouses, with how they're built, tend to be particularly prone to this. A publication called Energy Conservation for Commercial Greenhouses by John Bartok Jr. stated that in comparison to still air, a 15 mile per hour wind can double heat loss from a single glazed glass structure. Based on what I've seen at our farm without a windbreak, I believe it. So how do you prevent or slow down convective heat loss and lessen cold wind infiltration into your greenhouse? One way is windbreaks. Windbreaks break up or block wind upstream so that the downstream effects of convection and air infiltration are lessened. Why not a natural windbreak? I'm a big fan of passive solutions, so the first question some may have, why not just plant a big row of conifers or some other evergreen to block the wind? Valid point. I think a planted windbreak is generally a great idea, but we opted for a constructed one. Why? In our particular case, we actually like the windiness of the area in the summer. It helps to keep our greenhouses cooler and prevents us having to do any fan-assisted ventilation. The regular breezes here help to flush excess humidity from our greenhouses, something that most of our crops appreciate. A planted windbreak would take time to establish and also block some of those beneficial summer winds. So by all means, think about what's best for your growing situation and choose what works for you. So how do we decide the size and materials for the windbreak we'd build? Like any good nerd, I research as much as I could, but I'm indebted to energy conservation for commercial greenhouses for many of the decisions in the final design. Through that research, I found that a slightly porous barrier rather than an impervious one was actually better at preventing turbulent air on the leeward side. Blocking something like 50% of the wind was recommended. Additionally, the wind protected area was estimated to be around eight to 10 times the height of the structure. So a 10 foot high windbreak would have an effective area of 80 to 100 feet downstream of it. Close to ideal for a 96 foot long greenhouse. To protect the greenhouse from as large an area of influence as possible, the the fence was made to be 96 feet long. This was done to protect the greenhouse from the wind from a variety of angles and to prevent the effect of the increase of wind velocity seen at the end of windbreaks, according to the publication. Our windbreak is by no means perfect, and I'll discuss what I would change later in the video, but it's certainly still very helpful. Our fence consists of four main parts, the primary posts and support posts, the backing for the windbreak panels, the windbreak panels themselves, and anti-billow ropes. Component number one, the posts. First, the foundation of the windscreen, and arguably the one it's critical to get right. The upright posts as well as the support posts. All of our posts are built from black locusts we harvested and milled on our farm. We don't have any posts that are exactly the length needed because of the way black locust grows, so we lag screwed several posts together to create ones that were tall enough and strong enough to support the significant forces from the wind. These posts are spaced eight feet apart and are placed as deep into the ground as our auger can manage. I believe by around three and a half feet, and secured with concrete. A little deeper would be ideal, but these have been holding well. To support these posts, we dug and set a support post on the leeward side for each one, along with an angled member connected to the upright post and lag screwed it on both ends to secure it. These posts were free in that they utilized some materials we already had on hand, but I imagine these would have been the largest expense if we were to source materials from the outside. The largest outside expense with these self-constructed posts was the lag screws, and I imagine we used close to $100 worth of these screws till all was said and done. And let me tell you, I love those lag screws incredibly strong and really nice to work with. Component number two, the backing structure. The windbreak needs some sort of structure to attach to and push against. For a windbreak or privacy screen you've seen on something like a tennis court, it would be a chain link type fence. We happen to have some scrap sections of four by four square, four foot high woven wire goat fence from previous fencing projects, as well as some scrap high tensile wire. The goat fence formed the upper and lower parts of the fence and the high tensile wire filled in the middle gap. To pull the fence effectively, the end posts needed to be braced together, so an H brace was added. 
said. Component number three, the windscreen panels. The windscreen panels themselves were the primary purchased in portion of the windbreak. Instead of conventional windscreen material, we opted for 80% shade cloth as we had a supplier that could custom order lengths and widths for us, as well as whatever grommet spacing we wanted to temporarily secure the panel to the fence. Having trouble finding the source, but I read somewhere that 80% shade cloth would block something like 60% of the wind, which was in the range I was looking for. So rather than order one large panel, I opted for several smaller panels of 16 foot width and 20 foot width that corresponded well with my post spacing and would be easier to put up and take down. Plus, if one got a tear in it, I could replace just the one small panel rather than one very large panel. Finally, breaking up into sections meant that I could tie the panel into the fence at more regular intervals versus one large section just secured around the perimeter. The fencing is secured with zip ties with grommets at 15 inch intervals. 15 inches seems to be a good mix of stretching and securing the fence without seeming overbuilt. Component number four, the anti-billow rope. With the prevailing winter wind, the one we're trying to slow, coming out of the west and northwest, the fence backing and posts would take most of the load and the windscreen could be pushed against it during those rough storms. However, what would happen if we got an easterly breeze, one coming from the opposite direction? To account for this, we installed eyelets at the top and bottom of each post and used rope to prevent the panels from billowing excessively and wearing on the fabric or the connection to the fence. The rope is tightened as much as we could manage and crisscrossed down the length of the fence. This has worked really well for the life of the fence and we don't even have to remove it when we remove the panels. We finished our windbreak fence in early December of 2022. Since then, we've tended to remove the panels in mid to late April or early May once the threat of cold has passed and add them again toward the end of September before the cold weather starts. We leave several panels in place year round to protect any potted trees from excessive wind and prevent them from tipping over as regularly. It's really hard to quantify the effect of the windbreak, but before the windbreak was installed, we had around 300 nights in our greenhouse above freezing. And after the windbreak, our days below freezing dropped to just a few per year. Obviously, many things can influence this and we pushed our thermostat settings going to that 2022-2023 winter, but the windbreak seems to have given us the ability to set the temperature a few degrees higher on those really cold, windy nights. The decreased heat loss means that we start our season earlier in the spring than was possible without it, leading to earlier ripening for our figs. So what did this cost to build? As mentioned, many of these items were available on the farm and so skew the total cost to a much rosier picture than it would be otherwise. As I mentioned, our primary purchases for the windbreak were lag screws and shade cloth material used as a windbreak fabric. The total for those two items came to around $530. If we had to purchase fencing for the project, I believe we paid essentially a dollar per linear foot for our goat fencing originally. So with two runs of fencing rounded up, that's around $200 in original costs. The cost of the high tensile fence wire that we used in the middle was pretty minimal and it tends to be pretty inexpensive. So I'll lump it in with the cost of the goat fencing along with the cost of the staples to attach the wire and the fence. Posts would be expensive, not to mention the addition of needed support posts. With 13 posts spaced eight feet apart and with each post needing a buried support post and an angled post, I could definitely see each coming to close to $100. So a very rough estimate of $1,300 for the support post plus $200 for the fencing plus $530 for the windbreak fabric and maybe $10 for the rope gives a very rough materials estimate of a little over $2,000. Of course, your mileage may vary where you are for materials. Is that worth it? I think it's a judgment call that really comes down to your operation, how windy it is, and how quickly you think it may pay off depending on how you heat your greenhouse. I'll let you decide. So the windbreak has been working great for two years now and hasn't failed or needed to be reinforced despite many nights with steady winds at 20 to 30 miles per hour with gusts, I'm sure around 50 miles per hour. Our only maintenance on it has been the 30 minutes to an hour to put up and remove the panels each fall and spring. So what would we change? Just a few things. First, I'd likely make the structure a little taller if possible. This would be more difficult to do with the type of posts we made, but I think it could make for a slightly more effective break. Currently, the peak of our greenhouse tops out at around 14 feet, so it sticks up above the fence so that relatively undisturbed wind still reaches the top of the structure. Second, I'd likely make the windbreak longer or orient it more to block the prevailing northwesterly winds that we get when a storm is blowing in. Currently, we have a building that blocks some of that wind, but right now the windbreak is primarily on the west side of the greenhouse. Third, I'd make all the windbreak panels longer, or at least match the longer panels now at 24 feet if not 32 feet. Less attachment points could lead to a bit more billowing but we really haven't seen this to be an issue with the fence and that would make the process of putting up the panels and taking them down slightly faster. These three items are pretty minor things and all things we can certainly live with. Overall we've been very happy with this mostly passive solution. It works as intended, has been pretty much maintenance free, and provides a lot of benefits to our greenhouse environment. As you can see from some of the footage, we're even growing some trees on the leeward side of the windbreak fence that we hope to espalier against it in the future so the structure will serve two purposes. Thanks for listening. If you've built a windbreak and would have some feedback, we'd love to hear from you in the comments. What aspects of the design would you change and why would they help? God bless. Thanks, y'all.